show today, but we are recording the meeting so that anyone who wanted to watch it, they'll be able to watch it later. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. All right, so we're going to call the meeting to order, and Madam Clerk, can you um, note that I am here as well as um, my um, dear, beloved friend, um, the Honorable Howard Duvall, as well as the Honorable Will Brennan. I like him a little bit, too. <laughs> um, and we're going to get right into it. Um, our first presentation today is going to come from Ms. Felicia Kilgore with the Department of Community Development, and this is the 22-23 Community Development Block Grant Consolidation Consolidated Annual Performance and Evaluation Report. report. And we just call it the CAPER. Okay. CAPER. Good morning, everyone. Um, Good thank morning. you, Tina. Kind of outline what we're going to discuss this morning. And so, what we have here um, is a um, our performance review in terms of our activities um, utilizing our funds that we receive from HUD. And so, um, what we will be sharing our um, numbers, our activities, funds dispersed. Um, this is not a final document. Our final document is actually um, due into HUD on September. September the 28th, and so you would see, you all receive, council members will receive a final document of all funds dispersed. So as we speak today, we are still dispersing dollars um, as relates to um, several of our activities. So the numbers that I will share with you um, this morning is based upon um, our drawdowns in our IDIS system from um, Friday, this past Friday, uh, which is. Um, I think fell on the 10th, I want to say, is the date of that. Okay. So I do have outlined our dates uh, as relates to the CAPER. Um, we do have a requirement of a 30 day uh, public comment period uh, that will allow uh, constituents and residents to uh, review our activities, our disbursements, uh, and make comments towards those. Uh, it opened up August the 25th, and it does close out on September uh, the 25th. And of course, we're sharing with you this morning uh, with the City Council Community Development Committee uh, here during this meeting uh, today. And of course, we have our scheduled uh, public hearing uh, that will be held at the Eau Claire Print Building on September 21st, uh, starting at 6 o'clock in the evening. And anyone is actually able to come, our local residents, anyone interested in wanting to review our activities, um, our performance in terms of uh, how much we disperse towards those very activities and make their comments towards those. And so just a quick question. Absolutely. So today was noticed as a public meeting. Yes. I just wanted to see, is there anyone here who from the public who happened to come, just in case someone has anything to say? No, right. Yes. Yeah. Right. Just want to make sure. Very good. So outline um, here we have our funding sources uh, based on um, the various programs um, allocation that we see directly from HUD. Um, it reviews, outlines our revenue, which is our mostly our entitlement that we see this fiscal year, as well as program income. So if you notice for our CDBG, uh, we receive, this is entitlement, as well as program income, um, $2,205,987. And we've dispersed um, thus far, and this is from Friday, um, this past Friday, $1,766,337, as in the CDBG. If you notice, um, our CDBG CARES um, coronavirus aid funding, of course, we have a um, period of six years to completely expend all those dollars. So we do have some more time um, to actually expend. But I want to share where we are uh, in the dollar amount that we receive to support that particular program. And please keep in mind, we do have various activities um, that we have outlined to support that. So we received $1,588,189. One 
and thus far we've dispersed three hundred seventy-eight thousand five hundred eighty-one dollars. And what year are we in now? We're in the. Uh, this is um, uh, results from our fiscal year twenty twenty-two and twenty twenty-three. Well, as far as the six years, where are we? So we're what? I mean, we're in our third year. So um, for our home, which is our home investment partnership program, um, entitlement plus program income, we have um, in revenue one million two hundred ninety dollars, two hundred ninety thousand three hundred twelve dollars, um, and we have expended um, thus far forty two thousand two hundred eighty three dollars in a four seventy four six. Now we are in the process of putting out a NOFA. A notification of funds. Uh, we're scheduled September the September the 19th, uh, next Tuesday, as a matter of fact. We'll be meeting at the um, oh, uh, excuse me, the Earlwood Community Center there, and so we are encouraging all nonprofits and for-profit organizations to actually come out to our application workshops uh, and kind of go over the guidelines as it relates to um, the home program to support some of the additional affordable housing units. So we do have plans to expend those dollars. For our HAPA um, uh, revenue, we have $1,689,158. And we've expended thus far uh, $1,550,300. And of course, uh, for our HAPA CARES um, coronavirus aid, we receive um, $220,838, and we've expended thus far um, $119,000. As a matter of fact, uh, that particular program does end uh, this year, and um, our deadline to have all monies expended is on the 16th, 16th of September. And just as I mentioned earlier, we are in the process of drawing down some additional expenditures as it relates to um, the COVID, um, coronavirus aid. Any questions? So we feel comfortable that we'll, we have we spent the full 220 for HOPWA. Based so on our calculation, we're, um, we're close uh, we to spent it. everything except for 14 cents. Uh, very good job. Okay, so um, looking at our total community impact uh, with all of our program funds, um, we have expended this fiscal year $3,172,409. If you notice our leverage, um, our leverage impact, which includes other government federal funds as well as state and local dollars, so we've actually had a community impact of six million nine hundred ninety-three thousand three hundred forty-nine dollars. For our CDBG uh, disaster recovery and our CDBG mitigation uh, programs, if you notice here, uh, for our mitigation, it's actually highlighted in the red and orange color there. Year to date. Um, we received uh, $725,587. We've expended, excuse me, year to date, $725,587 for when the funds were received. And this reporting period, this reporting period here, which is our fiscal year, 2022-2023, we've expended $121,616. For our disaster recovery, if you notice our year to date, when we were first received those dollars, uh, we've expended $21,478,518. Um, this reporting period, this particular fiscal year, we've expended $6,283,438. And so, Felicia, just for my, just for my ignorance, what was the total mitigation? 
budget or allocation? That was received. It's the movie at five.
um, with COVID and all kind of changes that we had, I just wanted to know that we're staff that we're staffing back up and get because that's what that's what the issue is to do is the homework. So um, I'm glad to yeah, see that we're back rolling. Some staffing changes. Yeah. Um, the past year or so, and um, so yeah, we we fully almost fully staffed, um, but our housing side is definitely fully staffed. And yes, we're working together to kind of ramp that program back up again. Excellent. One other thing on the housing that I think is important for us to understand is that we have 363 <coughs> loans in our housing portfolio, and have have a um, loan volume of over 14 million dollars. A lot of cities don't do that, <coughs> and they, they grant the money out, Absolutely. and then they don't have any money coming back in from the repayment of those loans, just like we did on the enterprise loan. So the city <coughs> fund, I believe, is the only enterprise fund that's still viable because they didn't grant all the money out. They that's used right. it to produce income Absolutely. that further is reinvested in the community. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. With a very, very low, 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 low default rate, which is even better, yeah. if any. But I mean, we rarely have defaults. We rarely have defaults. Um, and the ones that do come forth, you know, we try to work with those um, applicants to come up with some creative ways um, to modify their loans to help them stay in their homes. Because we make good loans. We make good loans. <laughs> 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 We assisted him with our home dollars, and uh, he actually has finalized his project. Uh, he is 100% uh, leased up, and um, he's over in uh, that project falls over in the Edisto community, and so we're extremely excited about that. And hopefully, we'll have more homes um, and units to come forth. As far as our Hopwa, um, we assisted 93 households. Um, for tenant-based rental assistance. And we assisted 528 persons with supportive services. Uh, use a uh, hospital dollars. Uh, we, we had 100 persons receive short-term rent and mortgage and utility assistance. And uh, we disper dispersed a total of $6,557,560 in hospital dollars. As far as our CDBG, um, let's see, we have so maybe that's it. But I will share this. Um, with our CDBG um, CARES Act, uh, we did support OBO um, assisting some of their recipients and actually save um, six, 17 actually um, full time positions um, by providing some additional dollars for them. And of course, we have completed uh, 43 single family homes utilizing the um, CDP disaster recovery funds this particular fiscal year. Any questions or concerns? I did, and I know we're not going to, not to go into any details, but the $2.5 million for um, ARPA to be addressed as a part of the September 18th funds. Is that a are y'all addressing that in that, or is that going to be a separate handling? Separate. 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 Okay. And that does not have to be included. Report. Okay. This report is for the fiscal year that just ended for that reporting okay. period. Right. That was submitted in um, with our yeah. year. Year fiscal year. And the only thing I just wanted to make sure we put on the record. Page seven, community improvement projects, Belmont, Brandon Acres, Cedar Terrace, just folks like to hear their neighborhoods. Sometimes they don't know. Um, College Place, Colonial Heights, Melrose Heights, um, Old Shandon, is that neighborhood of Old Shandon? And then Pinehurst Community Council. I think that I participated in a couple of the College Place ones. So i um, grateful for those. And, those are really good for the community because I, I like to see the community cleaning up its community. Um, and I think it encourages other people to do the same. Have I got any other questions? Sounds good. Thank you. Thank you.
Do you need us to take any action if this is just on the record? On the record. All right. Oh, and there's no one here for public comment. Oh, I can't do that. No one's here for public comment. I just want to know for the record that we did open it up and there's no one here. Mm -hmm. Well, thank y'all so much. Is that y'all good? Very good. Um, great work that y'all are doing. I appreciate it. Um, we will next move on to for committee discussion. Um, we're gonna. I'm gonna turn it over to um, Councilman Will Brennan to discuss Columbia Town and Gown Committee. Fantastic. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Um, from our last meeting, we uh, introduced the concept of the uh, Town and Gown um, Association, and we asked staff to to go and take a look at what that structure might look with the core tenets of uh, working in coordination with city universities, city universities in our neighborhoods to, to really focus on neighborhood quality of life issues and, and smart growth initiatives around the schools and the, around those neighborhoods. So today we um, are gonna hear um, what staff has put together um, from uh, Ms. Peyton Lang, uh, her official title is Policy and Programs Advisor, and uh, Krista Hampton, the head of planning. The uh, International Town and Gown Association is right up the road in Clemson, so I imagine they've been a, a good help giving us templates to help put this together. So I'm, I'm excited to, to get an update um, on structure and timeline and how we can move this, this forward and, and uh, really bring everybody to the table. So I don't know who wants to start. Um, we kind of split our updates okay. up. So since you tasked us with beginning the process to look at how Columbia could adopt this, we have met with USC. Ms. Best, I believe, is here representing them um, and kind of talked through what some other communities have done, what existing community groups there are with universities to ensure we're not duplicating exactly and kind of discuss what in partnership the best makeup for long lasting partnership with the committee. And as you can see, broken down is our current makeup under discussion. Um, we wanted to, number one, I will say, bring it to you to make sure it captures the vision as you asked us to report back. So just to walk through that, we have each of our college and university representatives here um, with a preference for a president or their designee to be active. Five City of Columbia representatives capturing Columbia Police Department, Planning and Development, Code Enforcement, Parking, and the Mayor's Office. The asterisk designates since the mayor will be the co-chair of this committee. This is an ex officio position unless he's not there to keep it at an odd number. And then four neighborhood representatives, and it's proposed for the clusters of communities around our Columbia neighborhoods to designate who this will be. So kind of influencing partnership there as well, because we feel like those communities need to be the most represented. Someone from the hospitality sector, as well as transportation. And this is kind of, we're fluid on the numbers here and making sure we capture enough voices, but not make it too complicated. And then of course, our co-chairs. Um, and that's kind of the first order of business, getting that structure in terms of what this will look like. And then from there, here are some topics for subcommittees that have been discussed, such as planning, safety, transportation, and parking, off-campus life to really capture that off-campus housing and talent pipeline discussed, as well as community engagement as our students are part of the community and hopefully transitioning into them. Um, so that's kind of the initial conversations we've had. Wanted to bring that to you, and I will let Ms. Hampton take it from here with the formalized side. Certainly. So the frequency too, it would be the frequency would be anywhere from three to four. Me, we're lab, we're green. So we're well, thank you for letting. <laughs> just, just wanted you to know the camera was looking at you. <laughs> no, really, thank you. Let <laughs> me know. <laughs> that was some scene. <laughs> um, and so the frequency would be three to four meetings. Um, so what you all really need to do next, but it does, it is going to require coordination from USC and the other colleges. You'll need to see whether this is the direction you want to head. If 
provide us some feedback, see um, what changes need to be made. We also need to make sure we incorporate any changes from the university, so we'll have to balance those as well and the other stakeholders. Mm -hmm. um, but then your colleagues um, will need to also endorse this at a, at the, at a city council <coughs> meeting as well. Pardon me. Um, and you know, our formalize the structure, appoint it as a committee as you have with your other committees. What would be great, too, is if you wanted to determine a timeline or is this a standing committee, how that, how that proceeds. Mm -hmm. um, and then more than likely, the subcommittees, you know, will need to go back and forth. We'll, those chairs, might it might be best for those to be designated by the group itself. Um, so that will be another step in the, in the process and, and formalizing which actual subcommittees. These are the ones that we, I think, agreed were addressing the issues and the needs as articulated by the by the council member, but um, if you see others, but still trying to keep it manageable as well. Um, so what what is your feedback? Uh, Madam Chair, I'll, I'll go first. Number one, is, is this a, a, a model that you got from town and gown, or, did, or is this something that's unique to the city? It's a little bit of a blend. So okay. we started with um, multiple local town and gown councils, kind of their makeup, and everyone does it a little differently. Right. And so the next step that I slightly mentioned is there was a former or current group at USC that engages community members, neighborhood associations. So looking at kind of how they built it out and then incorporating the wishes of number one, the mayor, and then council into that. Um, I believe just to go ahead, I know the how many representatives from each school were a really unique city to have so many universities and colleges here. So that's one thing that's not found very often. Um, a lot of times it's Clemson and they have Clemson University and then their technical school. So having this, I will say that's kind of unique from our research. Um, but it very much follows having people from the city, having people from the community, and then from the universities. If, when we discussed this six weeks ago, we were talking about maybe starting off with the university. Uh, USC is, is the participant with some from the city. Um, and, and now we've got um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, nine universities there. If we're going to use nine universities, I think we need to have weighted voted voting on that because you got, um, I, I think Lenore Ryan University is not equal to the University of South Carolina and the issues that will be impacting USC will be a lot different than will be impacting uh, the smaller universities there. So I would suggest that we uh, come up with a voting system that would give the um, authority of this town and gown to the universities that are really the impacting the quality of life that we're trying to control by this town and gown. And we can definitely look into oh, ways to do that before you come in. And I totally disagree. Okay. Before you start working yeah, on that's it. That's why we um, have a democracy. Yeah, before you start working on it. Well, no, because I did get, I got a couple of calls from some constituents saying we don't agree with just the one university. Um, and so I I don't understand why we would do the weighted. I, I know what you're saying, but we have to be careful. Well, you know how you are, Howard. <laughs> and you know how I am. I mean, y'all know what I'm saying. But um, making sure that we don't make any particular university or college feel less than, um, than the University of South Carolina. I mean, and I have no qualms. My baby went to University of South Carolina, but we want to make sure that we handle it um, because, for instance, that may be the primary issue over there, but Columbia College and their neighborhoods, okay, is just as important over there. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if it matters how many people you have or the weighted voting. I, I wouldn't want to give University of South Carolina folks more decision power. Does that make sense? Because they want it over their part. I mean, I, you want them to have more control over their area, but I wouldn't want them to have control over other areas. So I don't really understand that. You got 19 voting members. Does that include the CPD, the Planning and Development Code Enforcement, all that? Is that where you get the 19? As it currently stands, yes. 
Um, maybe we go back to the, all of those would be ex officio members and the voting members be the universities. And then you could have a uh, total student population and you get to vote as a percentage of your student population. I think Ms. Wilson had a question. Just a point of clarification for me, and this I'm probably dating myself because in the olden days, as Mr. Duvall was <laughs> I'm talking about earlier, but when we used to, we had an iteration of stops and starts of working on a town-gown formal relationship, which was really based upon ITGA and the when Clemson first started and the host site and all of that. And I don't know, and I haven't been part of this discussion since I was out, but if this, what we're formalizing as a city, is sounds like intended to be more broader than what ITGA, I think, prescribes as cities with a flagship university or a college um, suited city that is specific to the city and that college relationship, right? So if I, is ITGA and y'all's research still structured like that, which I think it probably is, I'm just point of clarification. We're not, the intent of this isn't mm -hmm. to necessarily follow the ITGA model, which if it is not, then I think the direction y'all are going, because we're a college town with lots of colleges and universities, and you're trying to create something that's more inclusive to what we're doing right here in Columbia with them, versus being a member through ITGA necessarily, which I think we probably still can be a member, but it's that usually is like a, the city and the respective college or university which they have all the over the years they've really developed and they have all of the you know the programming and the conference and the probably some of the resources Krista found when they were researching is that am I off on that or is that well, I think that goes back to what y'all were saying earlier. The distinction is that we have several schools. Now, if y'all are saying we're the only, like, you got to tell me, like, I guess like Ms. Wilson is saying, we're doing something different, period. Is So that's a big, that's important, I could think for, because maybe I'm the, you know, I didn't go to USC. Y'all had to remember. Um, but um, if that is, I don't, I have no intentions of trying to, change the concept of a national program. So I guess what my next comment will be, um, are there, is there something in addition? Because I, I mean, our school's going to be, the other school's going to be offended, but is there another model that incorporates, because you can have both, I think, mm -hmm. but is there another model or do we create a separate model? Because again, I, if this is working and, and it works, that's great, but we do have to make sure we have something and it could just, I don't know how we do that, but a different model for, like, to make all of the schools feel inclusive. Does that, is that too much work or, but a, but I, I'm just going to tell you, I know, because I've already gotten calls about it, um, and I, I'm, we need to have something that addresses the other schools too. Um, we could always reach out to ITGA and just we're not the only city with multiple colleges and universities and find out what they've done in other areas and how they've addressed that. Well, I think the 900 pound gorilla is the University of South Carolina and that's the one we need to get to. And we know to, that, Howard. To take them. Let me ask you, um, Krista, you know, one of the core, I guess, drives for this is our, our retention of talent. You know, all these, all these colleges and universities put out great talent. Do you think that layer is different than the original mission of some of the ITGA stuff that you've seen? I mean, is that is that always part of their mission? Is we want to roll, roll out the red carpet for, for our student population. We want to give them the best experience um, that they can have mm -hmm. for them to want to stay, grow that small business, start that family, grow that family, and contribute. Do you think having that in our kind of mission is different from what you've seen uh, over research in the past? When you look at most of the 
committees. It really is about communication among these large institutions and, and ensuring that policies are aligned. I mean, I'm, I'm certain that is a, an auxiliary goal of some of these, but generally speaking, it's about that you have these two large institutions that are sometimes on divergent paths or not communicating mm -hmm. and trying to make sure that happens. Right, so that's kind of my point. Is we, we're, we're layering in something that I think is unique to, to a lot of these uh, associations elsewhere. I, I completely recognize your, your point about communication and, and growing together, campus, city. Um, but I think it's very important that we, we include not only the University of South Carolina, but the other institutions in some form or fashion for voting. I don't, you know, um, in, in that, because the end goal is, you know, making the best experience for, for these students, you know, for them to want to stay. Well, and, and for me, learning a little bit more about the overall intent, um, I would almost suggest um, looking at town and gown as the need almost for the university and the city. Um, and then talent retention, maybe that being something totally separate that addresses every you know, that has every school. And maybe that makes it a little less complicated, maybe. Because first of all, you narrow down the purpose and you kind of know what you're doing. Um, and then you can have whatever the curriculum is or whatever the goal is or whatever the programming is, it's the same. Um, and everyone feels the same. That's that's just what I would throw out there. Um, would would, would, would y'all suggest when this is formed, having the, the, the first group having a strategy session, um, you know, to kind of paint the picture of what the, the next five years for an organization like this looks like? Did, was that recommended at all by the association? I haven't seen it in, in the, the documents I looked, but for any good group, you know, that usually yeah. is a good idea to determine what you're, what you're going to tackle, at mm -hmm. least for the first several years. Mm -hmm. um, and then your subcommittees as well, if you choose to have those, can have that same Oh, let them figure it out. Are you saying, well, I was going to say, and we do have University of South Carolina represented here. Do we, do you, have y'all discussed this at all or have any thoughts or input? Um, we had a great meeting a couple weeks ago and um, just talked to go back and yeah, we're, we're back live. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, yes, we had a good meeting a couple weeks ago and talked to, through all what, what Peyton and Krista have kind of briefed y'all on. This is a, a beginning step, and we at the university want to include all the universities in the area. I think we can all find that together we all have different issues. You know, the city of Columbia, um, and we might have Columbia College, like you said, is going to have some different issues than the University of South Carolina, but there's going to be some overlap on issues. So we're all still trying to find our way in this and would love your guidance. I don't know that we have 100% answers for y'all today, but... Maybe we come back together again and um, with some more council input, see how we define. If we're willing to work, you know, together with everybody in the community, because I think that makes us a better community. I think Missy probably makes a good point on all of Rebecca about maybe some additional um, input. Have you all actually talked to ITGA <laughs> leadership? Just yeah. one yeah. for our resources, but not an official meeting. Yeah, it may be timely now to just just ask more direct questions about the structure um, as they see it and what works best. Is it, you know, can this structure that the city's trying to create work under the auspices of ITGA or can, you know, go into the conference and taking part in some of the programming and that sort of thing just be something that we aspire to utilize as a resource. I do think, unless it's changed a lot, the original mission with ITGA really, as Krista said, is about um, some of the things that I think we have as an offshoot been doing with the bank and the university, you know, ambassador programs and cleanliness and move in and move out and how are students behaving and how are, you know, how are cities um, making sure their residents understand that they're living amongst students and that the university understands vice versa what accountability and responsibility means for students and the universities. 
from my memory and my understanding, that was the flagship piece of town and gown. I think surely over the years it has morphed, hopefully, to them addressing some of these other really great issues like retaining talent and attention. But if that is what I think you all want to be the focus of this, then maybe you need to build it around that's the focus and then use IGGA maybe as a resource or also some foundational things that might more apply at times to the university just because of where it sits and, and what it brings to the table and some of the things we're already working on with our staff. Um, and I think too that the one of the things about USC is it's so broad that you do have residential components within the city which creates the need for the, I mean not within the campus, which creates the need for the communication. Um, and so a lot of the other campuses are not like that. However, I do think that we've started having issues with Allen um, and some of the development that they're having and, you know, going back and forth. So, I, I mean, I can see it different ways. Y'all just tell us what, I mean, we just want to find a good structure, but I think this is, because I also try to look at, well, where are we having the issues? Mm -hmm. I'm not going to say the school, I mean, yeah. you know, um, by the numbers, because of the sheer numbers, we uh -huh. tend to have more issues, and I think it's because we have the residential that's on the campus, um, but we don't hear a lot of those same types of issues from different schools, if that makes sense. So like a lot of these are out and have their own campus, and there is no interaction, so there are no problems. So um, I think it kind of goes back to, first of all, let's be clear what we want to achieve, what that program allows us to do, and how we can kind of marry the two. Yeah, I, you know, looking at it now, I, I, it, it almost seems like we should just make another subcommittee, the, the talent retention component, mm -hmm. um, uh, with an economic development kind of draft. Um, I think that would be yeah, yeah, better. Yeah, I think that, yeah. Mm -hmm. And then I, let me ask you all a question. The four neighborhood representatives, the college and university clusters, um, what, what's, what's the vision there on the process for doing that? And, would it be just, just I guess, a, a more efficient uh, appointment process, one per per district representative? Um, what's what's the thought there? I uh, do you want to? Yeah, we didn't. There's a number of neighborhoods around each of these, and so um, instead of having one from each neighborhood, it would be one from each district. So, and who appoints that? Council at this point, okay. right? I that's, think I that's just what, to make that, that was the idea. Okay. Um, but again, that can, if you all feel strongly about something else. Council uh, appoints those four. Yes. Oh, yeah. Okay. Well, actually, I mean, council, let's see, and the hospitality sector. Who else? You've got the two committee co chairs. Well, right. Yeah. Well, so you would do the hospitality sector because there's more than one hospitality so point sector. Five. Okay. Yeah. Would, the council, would you make it an appointment one per council district? Hmm. I think you got to look at where the cluster of neighborhoods are yeah, you know, around the colleges. Yeah. Uh, there are districts that have a lot of in, uh, impact true. from the university, mine being one of them, my home, not my district, uh, being one of them. Mm -hmm. And I would think there again, if we're going to have a representation, it, it ought to be representatives from people that are feeling the impact of the students. Oh, oh yeah, I, I agree. Yeah. And that's, I agree that, that those impacted by I'm you. I'm so glad we agree. <laughs> oh, well, so we're, an application process. Well, look, we're agreeing, <laughs> but... Well, and and the their intent is though too. Right. So is that the what the intent is to address is it about addressing those things or is it about more about that's you know, that's always gonna be there, but this is about talent and retention. I don't know that that matters as much about the you know, like it would seem more balanced and even across the city. You're everybody's gonna care about talent and retention. Right. But I don't, again, I'm just, you know, I'm always over here like the devil's advocate, what's your intention? But your, your first, your first description about how it was when, when it got started is 
is the feeling that I have too. It, it needs to be more about helping the university and the city population get along together to discuss problems, to solve problems. Talent retention can be a subcommittee of that. That's why I think we need to have either uh, less representatives or weighted voted, voting because um, I, I think the, the, the biggest person or group that needs to be at the table is the university and the city neighborhoods. What, what, what do we so think? is that expanding on the group that's already working from the university and the neighborhoods? I mean, I know it was focused on a specific part of campus, but expanding it to the whole footprint, because there's a group already doing that. Mm -hmm. um, it's just not looking at the whole university. It's, and Rebecca, please speak up. If, um, yes, there there is has been a group that is well is a group that is working, um, and primarily, like you said, a lot of it's focused around Campus Village, where the new opening was, and so that group is the ambassador program. And so the mayor met with us when we met, and he very much wanted to include other schools and universities. He didn't want to leave anybody out. But like Teresa has a really good point. A really was more University of South Carolina with local folks, neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe it, it starts in that and this is a subgroup. I don't know. We are still learning how to make this work. But there is a group already that's engaged and working in the neighborhoods. And we work with Jim and the other neighborhood leaders. Um, so maybe that's a segment. I, I don't know. But we are doing, there is a lot of communication daily. And I will note, the printing made it a little to the side note, even for myself, the University of South Carolina has been instrumental in helping us kind of form some options. And that's one reason that they will have a co-chair with the mayor for the first iteration is what we're suggesting. So I don't know if that's weighted per se, but, you know, that's now two representatives from there in our current conversation. Um, so that's one thing I would add. Okay. Maybe see something. Jim, to the speaker. You can make a three-minute point, Jim. Okay. Erica, you got your time. Uh, two points. <laughs> oh, I got one. Jim Daniel, Wells Garden Neighborhood, uh, the Hill Neighborhood Association. Two, I count seven schools. Can y'all, I mean, can some... There's seven listed. Seven. I thought you said mention nine. I just couldn't count. Yeah, okay, so be. seven. Okay, I, I'm, I'm there. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, what do I see is talk, the issues that I think our neighborhoods or the surrounding neighborhoods have seen is the left hand doesn't know what the right hand's hat doing. The USC does one thing, but doesn't let your city know. The city does something, doesn't let the university know. That, I think, is part of what the town and gown committee, so they all talk to each other. And then we've got these subgroups that are working now in the neighborhoods that, you know, so far so good on what the university has instituted with surrounding neighborhoods. But that's where I see what's missing is the two major gorillas don't talk to each other. Thanks. Yeah. So can we, the four neighborhood representatives, this is, this is going to be, is this an ad hoc committee moving forward? I don't know what structure it's going to take. Can we just assume that it's interested citizens apply via our applications, comes to council, and we appoint four? Yeah, I'd, I'd say appoint four, but don't limit them to one from each district. Right, right, right. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I, I, at some point, I think we need to make that call, though. I am, I'm just going to tell you, I'm totally fine with town and gown being for the University of South Carolina. I can say that. Um, and then we figure out what we do for talent pipeline retention. I don't know if that's really a part of No, I think that's, and looking, looking back now, I think it is a subcommittee. Um, but I think in the yeah. application process, you let that resident tell, you know, if they don't live around the University of South Carolina, if they live somewhere else, let them, you know, state their case as to what they can contribute. Um, and I think it, this is kind of where Howard and I are agreeing, but not agreeing. Let USC residents, citizens, and students, and um, representatives, they should honestly let them weigh in on their own issues, which is maybe more extreme than what you're saying. Mm -hmm. 
because Alan and Benedict, honestly, they don't want to weigh in on your issues because, you know, they want to deal with their own issues. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're kind of saying the same thing, but um, however y'all can structure that. But do you see what I'm saying? Like, we may want to, they may want to know just so they can see how you're handling things. But yeah. I, I think, you know, y'all vote, y'all, that sector that is being impacted votes on that mm -hmm. issue. I would take out the five city representatives as voting members. Send them back to the drawing board and let them talk with Town and Gown International and see how other cities have got them structured and, and see if you can find a city that's got multiple universities. I mean, Clemson ain't got room but for one. So. <laughs> well, so one quick question. It was the goal to increase communication between residents and the school or the school and the city? I think all three. All three. Yeah, all three. Yeah. So I don't know if I would take the city reps off. That's a, that was He's just saying thing. don't let, let them vote. They're, they're still, still on the Yeah, they're still advisory. They're still participating. They that's, give, that's giving they our staff five votes. votes. No power. Well, well, essentially, <laughs> the only thing that this committee is bringing forward is recommendations. Yes. That's what we're voting on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so it, it would have to go through the other silos to get yeah. buy-in. So. Okay. I think we have enough to talk to ITGA and bring back a yeah. follow-up recommendation. Sure. Great. Thank y'all so much. Any other questions? All right, so um, we're going to move very quickly to the mobile market update. Thank y'all so much. Um, and, I, and Jim, thank you for staying under the time limit. Um, we're going to move. So no one told me we had a meeting. I'm sorry. Okay. Who was in the other meeting? Right now, we will start at one o'clock, and then the ED and I. Okay. So we're okay right now. So what's going on right now? Mrs. Brown's having a separate meeting with staff about something. Okay. Yeah. I thank you. I didn't know. I'm sorry. My apologies. Do you all need to go to that meeting? You two invited to that meeting? I wasn't invited. <laughs> all right. And last, no one told me, so I'm sorry. I didn't know. Um, but we're going to move it along. Um, I'm going to start. Miss Aisha Driggers is going to give us the update on the mobile market, and we're going to get to meet um, the wonderful folks who are going to be uh, who were awarded the contract. I'm super excited, and then I'm super excited because someone told me last night that they also have they showed me pictures of this grocery store downtown that was really cute, and I felt like I knew something that other people didn't know, so I really got excited. So I'm going to turn it over to Miss. Um, triggers. Yes, so I came before you a couple months ago to announce the selection and the award for our Food and Security Solutions Initiative to Tom's Creek. And I do have um, Shauna Cato. It looks like she's about to leave. Okay, I thought she's about to leave. Uh, yeah, so I appreciate um, the Food Policy Committee and all their input they provided for this process. And they've continued to be great partners. Um, also, thank you to Procurement for helping us get to this point. So we promised at that meeting that we would come before you again to introduce the selected vendor. So Larry from Tom's Creek Family Farms is just going to share um, some information about the business and then their um, steps moving forward. Um, we're very excited to award this contract to Tom's Creek. So, Larry. Thank you. Couple things. I'm Larry Schneider, Tom Creek Family Farms. We have a 200 acre farm out in Hopkins. Um, we started in 2017. We have seven big high tunnels. We grow 365 days a year. Um, we just invested $2 million in the city of Columbia in our store, ma'am. Say that a little bit louder and indirectly. <laughs> no, 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 directly into the microphone. You moved it away, yeah. So we purchased the property at 912 Lady Street, Unit 100. For $1.2 million, and we have invested almost $700,000 into the grocery store. She has been there. She saw. She has been there twice. It was where the city studio seller was. We actually purchased a basement in 2015, and that's where Columbia Farms started. The original chicken hatchery was there. The building's 125 years old. It was actually Hanson Feed and Seed. It started as Kirkland Feed and Seed. And 
Then it went to Hanson. So we actually brought it back to pretty much the original of what it was. Where and we have other farmers coming in. My first farmer was in Thursday. Local farmer bringing stuff in. It's not just going to be Tom's Creek. But we're here to talk about the market. Yes. The mobile market. Yes. Um, and it will work with the store that's downtown too. They're going to work together. Um, the trailer has been ordered. Do we have? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, oh my God. The trailer was ordered. I tried to source it locally, and I could not because of the customization of it. It actually has to come out of North Carolina. It's just an example. This is an example, yes. Of So Kroger started this project about four years ago, a grocery store. And they did four pilot programs. I think it was four pilot programs in Boston and Cincinnati. Um, it works. We're going to bring the grocery store to the community. I'm excited. Yeah. So we'd be basically set up. We all have dairy, we all have a freezer, we all have a refrigerator. Farm fresh produce, more than the, the grocery store staple items though. We're gonna provide meat, cheeses, milk, South Carolina milk. That's inside the, the milk. That is inside the trailer. So you that's the, that's the, lay, the the layout. So we actually changed it a little bit. The back will be a, a drop-down ramp. You're literally going to come in, but I'm at, and this is going to be an awning on the outside, and I'm actually putting an awning on this side with another door, because some of the locations that we are working on, it's a little tight to get. My truck and trailer is almost 60 foot long, mm -hmm. so I'm going to make it so we don't have to position it exactly. I'm going to make it so they can either enter out of the right or enter out of, exit out of the right or exit out of the left, mm -hmm. so we can pull in pretty much anywhere. And we'll have an awning on both sides and we'll have outdoor setup. It'll be completely handicap accessible. I love it. I think that's it on that. Um, we're working with other stuff too. I have, I have a very good relationship with DSS on the Healthy Bucks program. Um, from scheduling issues, possibly. We're, but they are going to come out to the, wherever we set up a couple times, and they're going to present healthy bucks, snap benefits, everything to the community, give away some free merchandise, all that stuff. We've, um, I do Soda City. I've been doing Soda City Farmers Market for almost five years. Mm -hmm. I have a good relationship with one of the doctors at Palmetto Pediatrician's office, which is in one of the zip codes that we're targeting. They're willing to come out and do free child health checks, mm -hmm. stuff like that. Um, we also worked, my father-in-law is the, did they get a copy of this? No. Um, my father-in-law is Dr. Nusset Hickman from the University of South Carolina. He is in AI healthcare technology. He's a head care. He, with a team of researchers of masters, students, they want to come out and do some healthy eating studies along with the mobile market and stuff like that. And I like that too, because one of the things that that is going to be real is just because you have healthy food to offer, yeah. we also have to make sure that, that folks have the appetite for the healthy food um, and trying to navigate those waters. Um, but I also will say presentation is a whole lot. And I think that the presentation, I mean, folks are just going to come in just because they're nosy, even if, you know, I mean, honestly, I think because it, it's so, uh, the concept it looks well, so good. Is an example too. I mean, we're yeah. getting 200 to 250 to 300 people to put traffic in our store, yeah. which is a walking district in the best. Yeah. Well, I think that's pretty cool. Uh, how many days will you be mobiling? It is three days a week. For an, it's an 18 month program. We're, we're, uh, we propose to do two sites a day. Now that is just going to be a trial thing, depending on, we, we, we don't know how what locations are going to work. Right. Um, I'm working with her, uh, with her and, um, Parks and, Parks and Recreation. Yeah. yeah. Parks and Recreation is going to help us identify sites and, um, in coordination with some of the events that they have that have seniors coming on site. Right. Um, so we'll coordinate that schedule with them. Yeah. 
I was working with a couple of the assistant liquor facilities. I did a little market for them. Okay. I set up in their dining room. I pulled my trailer in, set up in their dining room. They could come down. They didn't have to leave the building. It works great. And I think we're going to target some of those too. Yeah. That's in the zip code. Oh. Larry, do you, do you have a, a Schneeberger on your menu? What is that? That's his name. Well. <laughs> um. <laughs> <laughs> I know there was a question before. I think Councilman Brennan asked about prepared foods. Uh, we did say you can't utilize, I believe, SNAP benefits. Yes, for prepared, prepared foods. There foods. Some options for us to add that, but it wouldn't be able to use the benefits. So we have a full DHEC inspected kitchen at the store, at the store that we built. But let me go on back to that question. But there will be prepared foods on the bus, on the mark in the yes. market. Okay. To an extent. Like sandwiches. No, it would be probably more heat and serve, take and bake stuff. I got you. That would feed a family of four. Stuff that I could do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I like it. I like it. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> does anybody have any questions? I'm really, really excited. That's, that's going to be a great program. When will it be operational? Yeah. Well, we, we spoke end of the year, but then we decided I really don't want to launch at holiday time. Good idea. I want mid -January. Yeah, mid-January. With the customization of the trailer, they needed an extra two weeks from what we considered. Right. And I want to get after the holidays. Yeah. I don't want to... It's too... It's going to be too kind of craziness. Thanksgiving, holiday, Christmas, New Year. And the good thing about having a mobile market is people don't spend money in January, but they have to eat. Yeah. So they're going to continue to buy groceries. So, as of right now, we're going to, we're going to look. It will be built by the mid January, mid December. I'll have it done, ready to go. Well, we're so glad to have you here, Just, Miss um, Miss. Well, you're not here, Miss Cato. We've been talking about this for a long time. So I know we're we're really happy um, to that we were able to get this to here. Thank you, Missy. Um, thank you, Aisha. And we're looking forward to anything we can do to help um, thank you right there. Thank you. Yeah. Well, our Vista friends are very excited about your new grocery store downtown. Too. You guys need to come down and see it. What time did we start? What's the last one? The grocery okay. store. Thank you. No, we're heading for the grocery store. Um, oh, it's like a sandwich. It's Ryan. It's Ryan in and out. <clears throat> Is, did Ryan have to go to the meeting across the street? Across the Possibly, hall? but Kelly's here, and oh, come on up, Kelly. I'm yes. here, so yeah, we, I think we can go around. Okay. Well, oh, no, that's fine. Um, so um, the next thing on the agenda, and hopefully we can do it in five or ten minutes, and if we need to come back, that's fine too. Now I'm a stickler, you know. Um, but this is the business license incentive for grocery stores. Um, and as you all remember, the mobile market is something that we thought would be a great temporary solution until, you know, we can get some more grocery stores, physical grocery stores in some of these areas. And Greenville had implemented um, a business license incentive program that covered a whole bunch of stuff. Like they were looking at all of the markets that I think that they thought they needed. So staff has looked at Greenville's um, Ordinance and made some recommendations. And Miss Kelly, what's your last name? Miss Smith. Smith. Can you take us through the recommendations that you all have? Absolutely. Um, so, in looking at Greenville's, excuse me, sorry. Um, in looking at Greenville's um, incentive program, they had it defined as um, a retail grocery store. Um, they specified the NAICS code on that just to make sure it's clear for applicants. Uh, we did the same in ours. Um, we also uh, went with speaking with Krista's team uh, from planning and development and established the business area and the boundaries. Um, and we have listed here the different corridors. Uh, I don't know if Krista wants to speak on that at all. <clears throat> did we run this by the school policy council too? We haven't shared that, but we will. Okay. Just make sure they get a, because they're the ones that did all the... <clears throat> At least the, the, all that researching, all the research data stuff. Yeah, just make sure they okay. Yeah. Okay. 
we also looked at uh, qualifying business, uh, meaning it would have to be zoned for that use in that area. We looked at retail business and defined it similarly to what Greenville had in terms of selling uh, food for retail, for home preparation and consumption, uh, fruit and vegetable markets, retail bakeries, specialty food products, uh, just to make sure, again, to keep it defined there's, so that there's no ambiguity there. Um, special emphasis on neighborhoods that had those food uh, deserts that you had mentioned before. Uh, which would fall into those corridors that were established by planning and development. We looked at it being uh, an application process and an approval process. Um, not certain on who, I, I would assume that it would be a committee such as you guys to review that, review the applications or OBO. Yeah. OBO yeah. would yeah. review yeah. them, excuse <laughs> me, and uh, make the approval, which would then prompt us at business licensing to um, kick off the the oh, reimbursement. They, we created another compliance thing that y'all had to look at. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> but I'm glad we have it. Yeah. Okay. Oh, thank you. Um, we established that it would be for newly established and qualifying businesses. We are we set out here that it would be one time per location, 100% of the business license cap. So you, you'd get one year back. Correct. Um, looking at Greenville's, they do they do five years. Mm -hmm. So they do five years max total. Right. Um, and they would be able to get that rebate for the five years. We just went with the one year, but. So I don't think that's a real incentive. Um, so I would look at something definitely more than five. Okay. But the... Um, helping establish buildings, um, I'm sorry, grocery stores stay was also real critical. So we, we do need to keep that because the only reason we're here is because we did have grocery stores that chose not to stay. So I think that's a critical factor. You want to look at more than five or more than one year? I mean, I just more than one year. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'd, I'd like to add Bull Street in up there with Colonial Drive. Colonial Drive and Bull Street. Make sure that the park is covered. Well, they already got somebody coming, but okay. Well, I haven't heard that. <laughs> no, but, but it's because it's still in the... They're always going to have a grocery store that's going to come. Let's, I really do want to make sure we check with the Food Policy Council okay. because it's based on where we need to attract. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm, I'm all open to considering other ones, but I want to make sure we got that part covered where the need to attract is and where we're worried about grocery stores leaving because Bull Street may have three real quick mm -hmm. with or without an incentive. Well, no without an incentive. But we have some of them that may not come. I mean, like, it may make a difference. Mm -hmm. What do you think, Will? Am I being, are we, which one of us is way, way off? Well, I, I think, I think we just need to add to, I guess, the incentive package. It's great that we're doing this, but at the end of the day, what's, what's the bait? Um, I mean, if I'm, if I'm, if I'm, if I'm hearing you, this is just for newly established stores. So but let's just say it's a smaller, add, yeah, right. So newly established, let's say it's an adaptive reuse of an old building, they turn it in. Think about tap fees if they have to, you know, bring in bigger water lines, um, stormwater fees, just stuff like that, that, you know. Make it some more. Yeah, that, that we as a water utility, mm -hmm. right, might be able to, to work with them on. I think I think that's that's the big driving number, getting up and running. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of times, you know, if if they're going to have a, a, I guess a prepared foods component, we put we charge for grease traps or whatever. We need to work with them on the grease grease trap program, stuff like that. I think just a a more a holistic approach to mm -hmm. to what we can really drive with our with our tap fees and impact fees. Um, hell, I mean, I'm good with waving them all because yeah. we're we're only. 
What are we talking about? A few dollars. Possibly, you know, half a dozen to a dozen, um, because the market's going to define mm -hmm. these 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 Yeah, it's food not like we're going to get infiltrated. And it would have to be a rebate, not a waiver. So, okay. Yeah. 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 So no, no, I am in total agreement um, because you know we want it to look appealing um, to really bring folks in. Um, and then I also too want to make sure that we make sure we keep the part that was removed for the existing businesses um, that are about to go. Because I, and I think we did that before Jeff told us that the fees were um, was it twenty five thousand was the average business it was license between fee between nine thousand and twenty two thousand. Yeah, so um, it's not a big huge loss of mm -hmm. money either. Right, and then, but if that's sustainable over five, seven, ten years. That that's going to push somebody who's on the fence about whether to do this or not. I think that can make a, a big a big change. And I hear you saying five, seven, or ten years, as opposed to one. Yeah. I think we need to. And look, that's a rebate. That's a rebate. A rebate. Right? Yeah. We need to look at what what uh, programs we already have in place for uh, grease traps mm -hmm. and uh, water taps and things like mm -hmm. that. It, it might be that we just need to get a little bit. A package of what we already have to to show, mm -hmm. yeah. Business mm -hmm. specifically for these, yeah. Okay. So, just for my clarity, are we we going to add? Well, we wouldn't necessarily need to add. Uh, to me, that's more marketing. The ones that we did earlier with business friendly, would those be sufficient to add? Well, I think these. This is if we're talking. A rebate of full tap fees and storm I mean, that's that's a more okay. That's, that's a deeper dive. Okay. Yeah. That's not what we did. Okay. That will take us. I didn't know if we needed a second look, so we do need to look at that separately again. Okay. And Greenville um, had in theirs a fifty percent for existing qualified businesses. Um, I don't know if that would be something you guys were interested 50 in. Fifty percent for what? Fifty percent of the rebate for their business license taxes. I'd, I'd go to hundred percent. Because again, I, I think we're only talking for existing that are dozen. already established no, no, in market. This is newly established. Yeah. Is, is but that's that's what, what she was. Oh, they yeah. they, they did a fifty yeah, percent uh, sidecar yeah. rebate for the existing like people. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah I agree two, with that. two different areas, and this is what I'll say too, because. Again, as far as I'm concerned, you're only as far as the rebate, particularly for existing businesses, we're only looking at the the scarce areas. It's only three or four grocery stores, you know. So I'm always looking at the cumulative effect, but I mean, it's not like we're talking about potentially thirty grocery yeah. stores and losing the funds. But right now, they're they're just not in those particular areas. If that makes yeah. some kind of way to I think we need it. to clarify and message that up front then, because what what will happen is is somebody not within the designated project area well why them and not us and we have a critical community need that we're trying to address right. with this so i think we just want to be kind of upfront and clear about that so we don't catch flack yeah and it it to the easiest way i think is to make it consistent with whatever we've outlined with the food policy council as the critical need areas because then you can say the food and can we say five years? Because y'all always have the option of extending later. If yes. Okay. Sounds great. Five, we can do five-year pilot. That's how we did with the um, CDB five-year pilot. See, see if it works. Then you may find out. We may, you know, five years. Maybe no one knows. Would Main Street include North Main Street? Mm -hmm. It would. It would. But we were also thinking downtown. I mean, it'd be great to have a grocery store downtown. So we we included okay. Main Street mm -hmm. deliberately. Okay. Well, so now that's going like Howard's way of throwing in, not throwing in, but just we adding what we want. Um, it gets away from. But anyway, that's fine. Just make sure all my stuff in there. <laughs> no, I'm just, I mean, I'm just being very honest. Make sure that we are addressing the food insecurity issues. Any y'all for chest? Is that is that fair? Okay, I can live with that. Main, main from the capital to uh, twenty, yeah. essentially. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We can, um, we can make it more robust. 
and Aisha can court just connect with them the food policy the, committee. Yeah, yeah. That's it. Make sure we don't leave anything out. Yeah, this is great. Um, and if whenever y'all get the updated draft, if you could just email it to us, we don't need to meet and go over it again. Is that fair? Sounds great. Thank you. I'm sorry we did go. Um, it looks like we went over about 15 minutes because we started at 11 17. Once it's updated and we reviewed it, is that correct? Um, I don't think we need to come back to another committee meeting, or do you? Refer to you, Madam Chairwoman. I don't think we need to come back for another committee meeting, but give us enough time to review it, email it to us um, before it even considers a council agenda. Do you have any other technical questions for me, Ms. Hammond, to make sure we're doing this thing right? I do not. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I suggest, oh, no, I suggest. Um, is there a motion for us to adjourn this very productive meeting that was fun today? We adjourn. Thank you. Thank you.